A, B, C. Easy as one, two, three. Simple as do, re, mi, A, B, C. One, two, three. That's how many growth plans there are. Hello. Welcome. I am Lisa Robin Young from lisarobinyoung.com, and this is another live edition of Creative Freedom, your dose of inspiration and education to help you own your dreams without selling your soul. Speaking of selling your soul, it's the end of summer. Tomorrow, we're taking my youngest back to Michigan. You can see all the silver sparkles have come in <laughs> over the summer. I'm grateful to be able to change that. Um, but we're not talking about my hair today, actually. We are talking about the three different types of growth plans for creative businesses and which type you might need for the stage of business that you're at. We've only got about a month left on registration for Creative Live. And one of the things that I promised you guys in last week's episode was that I was going to share these growth plans with you. Um, so that whether or not you choose to come, you're going to get that same kind of benefit and have some clarity for your own business that you might not otherwise have. Um, because at Creative Freedom Live, only a handful of people can be there anyways. It's a very small group. So I wanted to make sure that this information was getting out to people. Because one of the things that I see is people trying to grow in ways that are appropriate for the stage of business that they're in. And then they suffer the consequences for it. And I'll share a little bit more about that as we go today. Um, but I also want to let you know that this is an excerpt, another excerpt from the new book that I'm working on called Creative Freedom, How to Own Your Dreams Without Selling Your Soul, A Guide to Personal and Financial Success as a Creative Entrepreneur. So if that's you, you're in the right place because we're talking about growth today. Um, and the people who come to Creative Freedom Live are going to be the first people to get their hands on all of this content, this book, and, and all the treasures that it holds. So there's my shameless plug for um, my live event. Now, I will tell you, this information that I'm sharing with you today is inspired by the business growth life cycle that uh, my former client, Les McCune, wrote about in his book, Predictable Success, how to get on the growth track and, and stay there. This book is phenomenal. When I first read it, I was just like, oh my gosh, this explains so much. And Les has a backstory of launching a lot of businesses, I think more than 40 in before he was even 35. And in that launch period, like many linears, he noticed patterns and trends. And he's a self-proclaimed naturally lazy guy, and he's like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, so let me codify this stuff so that I can know, okay, here we go again, here we go again. And so he developed this life cycle. And we're not going to talk about the whole life cycle, but I'm going to show you the life cycle here. We start over here in early struggle. We grow to fun. Then we hit white water, predictable success. And then the other side of the chart is actually the decline phases of a business life cycle. So we're not going to deal with anything over here. Um, as you can see, the very last stage is called the death rattle. Um, we're only going to be focused on the growth side of this chart. And all of the resources for today uh, are on the blog. There's a link in the subject line where you guys can click through to, to read and see the rest of the resources. I do that every week for you guys. So we're looking at this growth cycle, and everybody starts in early struggle. Now, according to Les, early struggle is this place where your singular focus, the number one goal you have, is to find a profitable, sustainable market. Profitable meaning you're not losing money on it. Sustainable meaning you can continue to make money on it for the long haul. And this is this is the challenge that I see with a lot of creative entrepreneurs. They're like, hey, I sold something to somebody. That means I found my market. No. If you sell something to one person, you found a customer. And that one customer may be part of a larger market, but if you focus all your attention on that one person and recognize them as your market, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I see this happen a lot, particularly with chaotic creatives who build something because they're passionate about it, create something because they're passionate about it and share it and someone says, I love it, and they buy it. And now they're like, who is this person? Let me pick them apart. I want more people like this. 
And that's helpful. It's great to start to clarify who your right customer is. But if you get too specific with only one or two customers, it's going to be hard to find a market big enough to support your great work. Jim Henson learned this the hard way with shows like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. They're great shows, but they weren't commercially as successful as some of his other programs like Sesame Street, The Muppets, etc. Nothing wrong with those, but thinking that my Muppets audience is going to come see The Dark Crystal, my Muppets audience is going to come see Labyrinth, not necessarily true. And so you have to pay attention to what your market is doing. And if you focus in on a handful of people without having enough of an experience base to really resonate with that, then you got a problem. So we're looking for a profitable and sustainable market, not a profitable, sustainable customer. That is your only focus in early struggle because what happens is you're building out your business from some other resource, credit cards, personal loans, your savings account, money, spare change that you find on the street, like anywhere you can get money from, you've got to find a profitable, sustainable market before you run out of dough, Joe. And so that's why you need a transition plan. This is the first type of growth plan, a transition plan. And you'll see here, you're starting with all this resources and they're going to go away. Whether this is a day job for a lot of creatives, they start with a day job and they want to transition out, right? But you start with an income supply here and very little over here. And the goal is to get this ramped up as quickly as possible before this runs out. So anytime you're making a pivot, you're changing from this thing that I've always done to this new thing I'm going to do, you've got to make that transition before you run out of cash, before your income supply disappears. Because if you don't, you're one of the statistical, I think it's 85 or 80, 80 or 85% of all businesses fail and early struggle because they don't have a relentless focus on, I have to find the market that's going to sustain me profitably. I can knit till my fingers fall off and sell them for two bucks a piece, whatever the thing I'm knitting is. But if that's not profitable, it's certainly not going to sustain me. One of the examples I like to share is when I ran a candle manufacturing company, my ex-husband and I had the giving candle and we sold, made and sold candles. We're a small mom and pop operation working out of our house. We have very low overhead. We didn't have a lot of fixed expenses. So we could sell a handful of candles and it would be profitable, right? Well, we had a major industry competitor who did direct sales candle stuff and they had a particular product line that I absolutely adored and then they stopped selling it. Just stopped selling it. Now there were a number of reasons why they stopped selling it. Um, one, the factory that manufactured those candles went out of business. It, it burned to the ground if I remember correctly. And so, they didn't have a source to manufacture and they were going to have to reinvest to build a new facility and all of that. They also had a whole lot more overhead, so they weren't going to manufacture these candles anymore. They discontinued the line and I'm like, we can make those. And so we started making these transparent candles. You could see right through them and people started buying them and we didn't have to make millions of units like they did to be profitable. We only needed to make a few dozen and we were profitable. But the problem with that was it wasn't sustainable because I got pregnant and I had our first child together. That was clearly 11 years ago because that <laughs> son's 11. So I couldn't continue to manufacture at the same pace I was at before because I now had this kid and this whole different set of responsibilities. So selling a few dozen candles was not going to be profitable for us and it wasn't going to be sustainable because I couldn't keep pouring all day long because now I had a newborn to contend with. So we had to transition out of the candle company into something else. And that's when I started working more closely with direct sellers in a coaching capacity. I wrote my first book, Home Party Solution. People started buying it, asking me for support. I started coaching them. And here we are 11 years later, I am a business coach to creative entrepreneurs all over the world, not just direct sellers. But I had to transition out before I ran out of cash because my husband made it very clear, like this business rises and falls on its own. If it's not making money, don't look to me to put, to feed the kitty. Like that's not what this is about. So I had to make it work or I had to give up. 
So that's the first step is to have this transition plan. And very often when you start your creative enterprise, you are running with a jobby because you don't realize you need to have even more profit margin. One of the first things I do with almost all my clients is tell them to raise their rates. Not because um, that's just a thing to do, but because when I look at where their business model is and where they say they want to be, they can't continue to charge that kind of money for what they want and have a lifestyle that's commensurate with what they're expecting. Their business will not sustain them on those low rates. So they've got to raise their rates. And I think maybe I've had two clients in my whole lifetime that I've told, I haven't told them they need to raise their rates because they were already very clear on their pricing structure and they had built a profit inappropriately. But they were linear types too, <laughs> which tells you something about how the linear mind works and the number crunching and, and the need for accurate data and how they apply that in their business. I've said before, linears are typically the first ones to experience financial success in their business because they're good with the numbers and because they don't have any emotional attachment to the numbers like the more chaotic of us tend to do. So that first growth plan is the transition plan that takes you from doing all the other things into this new focus. And you have to make sure that they cross over properly or you're gonna run out of dough. It's just the way it is, right? So that's the first plan. And this is great for starting or transitioning, because it's called a transition plan, into the next thing that you're working on. Um, replacing an income from a day job, maybe it's a side hustle. Um, you know, like a rocket, it takes a lot of energy to, to get this thing up off the ground. You've got to kind of push a little harder energetically than you do when you get into the later stages of business development. So that's your first stage, that's your first growth plan is a transition plan. Now in the second stage of growth, Les calls it fun. And it's called fun for a reason because things are a lot easier. It's typically more than just you on the, on the boat here. You've got a team of a handful of people and it's kind of like a hub and spoke model is the way he describes it. You've got your owner operator in the center here and then you've got these people who work for you and support you growing your business. A lot of lifestyle entrepreneurs land squarely in this camp even if they're making millions or tens or 20 millions of dollars. Okay, even hundreds of millions of dollars, you can be a lifestyle entrepreneur and stay right here. In fact, the only reason to really push beyond this is if you've decided you want to scale something up. Uh, Les gives the example of, you know, you've, you've owned two or three coffee shops and you're ready to go to five or 10 or become a national chain. Well, then you want to move through fun into the third or fourth growth stage, um, which we'll get to in a minute. But for most people who are going to be reading creative freedom most of the people who are watching this episode fun is all you need fun is going to give you a great lifestyle it's going to give you plenty of income to do what you want to do and a handful of people that you trust to keep the ball rolling in your business fun is fun you're not dropping balls you're making good money sales are coming in and this is typically the time of exponential growth double triple digit growth year after year and you know you can sustain this period in your business for five or six years pretty easily when you get there the problem that i see is people jump too quickly from transition to this next growth plan that we're going to talk about because they want to be in fun because it's fun to be in fun and it's torture to be in early struggle right but they don't they end up trying to do what we call the momentum plan this is the second type of growth plan that's my really crappy rendition of snowball, the snowball effect. You start with something small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you're creating momentum. Things are moving. And so this plan is helpful, but only once you have a profitable, sustainable market in which to work, because if you don't have that, you can't get momentum. You start, stop, start, stop, start, stop all the time and you're banging your head against the wall. So instead you need to go back to the transition plan and work out where is that market? What, what are we doing here to, to reach the right people in a large enough quantity to make things profitable? There are YouTube creators who do a show every day and they spend two hours 
filming video game footage and doing walkthroughs of video games and they've got enough ad revenue and, and cross promotional revenue coming in that they're doing just, they're in fun. I get paid to play video games and talk about them on YouTube, right? But could they scale that up? <laughs> Probably not because that's a lot more videos and a lot more revenue they have to try and come up with, right? So they've got a very clearly defined market and they can stay in fun. But if you're not clear on the kind of video games you want to do or you know, who you really want to voice these to, do you want to voice them to young kids or teenagers or older guys? Like, who do you want to talk to? If you're not clear on that, you're going to be bumping up against the walls until you get that clarity. So there's no point moving into a momentum plan because you're just going to frustrate yourself with, I have all these things I want and need to do to grow my business and none of them are working or I can't get to them because there's not enough of me to go around. Why is there not enough of you to go around? Because you don't got enough money to make it happen because you're still trying to mm, do the transition plan and get to the point in your business where you're actually profitable and sustainable. So once you start your momentum plan and you move into fun, invariably you're going to hit the third phase of growth, which is not going to feel like growth at all. It's going to feel very painful. And that's white water. White water is this phase where all of the fun stops being quite so fun. Your business has gotten more complex. There are more moving parts and pieces. Things um, don't move as quickly as they used to. You're not as agile or responsive. Balls are getting dropped. Things are falling through the cracks. Promises aren't being kept, not because you're being a jerk, but because we don't have a system for handling that. And I didn't even see the memo come through and Sally's not talking to Joe. And you know we're not, because of the complexity of the organization, you're not at the point where you were when things were just starting to be fun. Things have gotten harder and now you're hitting whitewater and you have a choice to make. You can either scale back a little bit and stay in fun, which again, most lifestyle entrepreneurs, that's exactly what they do. Um, I think Leonie Dawson just went through this process where she's like, you know what, I'm stepping back and I'm going to do some things differently. I just need some breathing room because it's not fun for me anymore, right? She's got a global brand, but she's still very much a lifestyle entrepreneur. And so she has chosen to step back and she's not the only one. Several other people have, have said similar things in the last six to eight months about how they're changing the scope of their business because they're starting to hit whitewater and they're like, you know, that's not fun. I don't want to do that. Chaotics especially are like, mm, no, we're going to go back to fun. On the other hand, if you know you have a global position in the marketplace that is meant for you. If you've got an Oprah sized brand or business that you really want to take to the masses or to a very large swath of the masses, then scaling through Whitewater into that final phase of growth called predictable success is where you want to be. And Les says the only reason to push through Whitewater and into predictable success is if you want to scale, if you want to become a Starbucks or a McDonald's or an Oprah or an Apple or a, you know, that on that level of global competitiveness, global presence, then yeah, you're going to want to scale up because it can't be just you with all your fingers and all the pies in the business anymore. But if that's not where you're headed, if you're quite comfortable as a lifestyle entrepreneur, then own that. Scale back a little bit on the stuff that you're trying to commit to everybody and stay in fun. But either way, whichever one you choose, you're going to move into maintenance. Maintenance, it's easy to write this off. Oh, well, this isn't growth. Oh, absolutely it is. You see the, the upward pressure and the downward pressure. There's pressure to grow and there's pressure, you know, pulling you back. So you want to kind of stay the same here. That's the whole point of maintenance. This is the growth plan for folks who don't necessarily want to get any bigger, either because things are fun or because you've reached predictable success and you just kind of want to maintain where you at. Uh, this gives you room for experimentation. This gives you a lot less risk because you're kind of in that comfort zone. You're not pushing too hard to try and hit too many markets. You're, you're in your zone of genius and you're really comfortable there. But you're going to need a maintenance plan whether you move into predictable success or you move back down to fun because a maintenance plan in fun keeps you from pushing back into whitewater. And a maintenance plan in predictable success keeps you from falling back into whitewater or forward into the decline phases of your business. Now, what makes it maintenance? It's the balance of systems and processes and agility and responsiveness 
to what's happening in the marketplace in your business. Now, as a creative entrepreneur who creates because they love creating, that could be responsiveness to your life experiences, responsiveness to your customer stories. Um, you know, you see a new opportunity in the marketplace that maybe nobody else has touched and you want to go in that direction. And you want to be mindful of how are you growing? Or if you're in fun, what are you going to let go of in order to, to pursue this new opportunity? Again, Leonie Dawson, great example. She decided to let go of some things in her business so that she could launch something new and still stay at the size she wanted to stay at. Okay, that's the decision in fun is I can't do all the things. I have to be willing to let go of some things. What am I going to do? For chaotix, it feels like, you know, you're, you're, sent, you're graduating your kid off to college or something. It's that kind of a, a sensation. For, for fusions, it can feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm cutting off an arm. But once you do that, you're like, wow, I have so much more room. I have so much more space. This feels so much more comfortable. Most linears move on that path toward predictable success because they have that early financial success and because they're typically thought leaders, they have a message for the masses and so they're moving in that direction. And as soon as they can scale, boom, they're there. And that's where they want to stay. The problem that linears have, and this is what moves you into the decline phase, is that you rely too heavily on systems, processes, and structures and don't have enough breathing room and agility and responsiveness to what's going on in the market. Well, it worked for us before. We're going to keep doing it now. And that doesn't always bode well when you've got to be responsive to what the market is telling you. You know, we're going to keep doing radio and newspapers because it's worked for us for the last hundred years. You might want to rethink that plan. You might. You might not. It might be the perfect place for you. But you have to be able to respond to what's going on in the marketplace. And that's a key component um, when you're debating between creating the systems that move you from fun into predictable success as you go through whitewater. Whitewater is a need for systems and structures and not too many. You have to have the right amount. This is what I see chronically with chaotics. They come to me, they've been making money, maybe mid to high five figures, pushing on that six figure ceiling. Maybe they've even broken through six figures a couple of times. So they know what it tastes like, but they're not there anymore. And they're frustrated because Basically, they hit whitewater. They can't do it all themselves, and their high standard of excellence, that demand for everything to be perfect, has crushed them under its weight. Because now it's back to them being them, and it's just them and maybe a VA again, and they can't manage all the things to get themselves back to where they were. Well, unfortunately, until you add those systems and processes, which means slowing down and expecting your growth to slow a little bit or even stagnate a little bit, until you get those systems and processes, you're going to keep bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. So you either need to make a decision to stay where you're at and grow in different ways so that you can stay profitable or push forward and get through whitewater so that you've got something scalable and you can bring that message to a larger audience and maintain your profitable, sustainable business at the same time. So those are your three growth plans and when it's appropriate to use each type. Now I will say there are times when you're using the momentum plan that you'll come back to it after you've done a little bit of maintenance and things have started to plateau. You may decide, hey, I wanna grow some more. Okay, let's grow some more. We can stay in fun and grow, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're scaling. There's a difference between growth and scaling. So you wanna make sure you're clear on what are you trying to do here? and then apply the growth plan appropriately for your situation. Um, you know, Apple's got money in the bank. They're in the maintenance plan. Are they gonna launch some new products? Probably. Are they gonna push some new boundaries? Probably. But they've got a huge safety net to be able to do that. So they, they can use that maintenance plan, and occasionally when they found a winner of a product, we're gonna go momentum on just this thing right now, and we're gonna rock it hard, right? They can do that. Maintenance is a growth stage though, and I wanna make sure that I reiterate this because people go, well, it's maintenance. Um, Jonathan Fields, in an interview I did with him, once told me that there is no sideways step. There is no lateral move. Because even if you move to the side, the world is doing this. So if you go like this and the world is, you're already that far, much farther behind than where you were when you started here. You see that? So if the world is going to keep moving, there's no maintenance. 
that's static because it's technically not static, it's declining. So maintenance is a growth plan. It's a way to keep things, uh, enough new client material coming in the door, but not so much that it's moving you beyond the scope of what you intended for either your lifestyle business and fun or your scalable business and predictable success. Okay, so those are the plans. And um, like I said, there is a decline side to this scale. And you can actually use these three growth plans to recover a business, but we're not talking about that today because that would make this a much longer session, <laughs> a much longer episode than it needs to be. Um, but if you're coming to Creative Freedom Live and you have a business on that side of the life cycle, we will talk about how to use the right growth plan to get you on uh, the recovery track uh, as, as well. Um, so like I mentioned, this is all content from the book that I've been writing now for a couple of years and God's be praised. It should be coming out this November. So mark your calendars because I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and this is all content that we're going to be sharing at Creative Freedom Live in Nashville um, in October. It's October 12th through the 14th. So it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and you can go to creativefreedomlive.com to learn more. There are seven seats left. Um, and I've got two or three other people who are like, yeah, I think I want to go. But uh, if you snap up a seat before they do, then it's yours, not theirs. That's just, you know, how the cookie crumbles. So now I want to hear from you. Share your thoughts, your ideas. Um, what growth path, what growth plan do you need to be implementing in your business? What stage of the life cycle are you at? Are you just starting in an early struggle, still trying to find a market? Or have you experienced some fun and now you're pushing against white water and you're like, oh my God, when will the pain end? How do we make it stop? Les says that it's not uncommon for a business to bump through white water for four or five years as they're trying to figure out the right balance of systems and, and, and processes um, and to start accepting systems and processes because a lot of times there are people in the organization who will resist those systems and processes, particularly if you're led by a chaotic creative. It's just the nature of who you are. You have to recognize that, yeah, I'm gonna have to give up a little bit of control, but by incorporating those systems and processes, it's gonna free me up and give me the ability to do some other things that I've really wanted to explore. So be thinking about that. Um, maybe you're on the road to recovery, you know? Um, share your thoughts, your ideas in the comments. And let's be a rising tide for everybody. Um, because that's really how we can all grow our own profitable, sustainable businesses is by learning from one another and hearing those insights. So I look forward to hearing your comments. If you liked this episode and want to be the first to hear about the next one or get more like them, then subscribe and share me around. Subscribe and share to show you care. That's what I like to say. Um, and that is going to wrap it up for me. I don't see any comments currently. I'll be checking back later to see what you guys have to say. Um, that's going to wrap it up. Join me next week, same bat time, same bat channel, after the kids come back to Michigan. Uh, and we're going to talk about the four things that every creative entrepreneur needs to be successful in not only their business, but their life as well. And until then, uh, this is uh, Lisa Robin Young signing off in Blessings and Peace.